gear for mountaineering. We'll talk about layers. So I have here like all my layers. I've got my camping stuff, my backpack, um, my sleeping bag, um, and I've got, you know, my uh, technical gear. That's my ice axe. I've got my crampons, my helmet. So I'm just going to talk through um, and stuff for hands and head and um, gloves and um, socks, etc. gaiters. So I'm just going to talk through all of these um, items so that you guys have an idea in terms of what all do you need and um, what are the things you want to consider when you buy um, this gear <coughs> and feel free to keep pinging your questions in chat um, as and when um, you know something comes to your mind and I'll take logical breaks during the session to um, answer the questions. And if somebody in the chat already has ideas and something they've come across, uh, feel free to share as well in response to any questions getting asked. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll try to save the last 10, 15 minutes um, to also talk about how to pack everything in your, uh, in your bag. And we're going to focus on just the beginner climbs, something like uh, Mount Baker, Helens, Adams, Mount Shasta, um, where you know you're not spending more than two three days on the mountain you're probably going guided so you're not having to carry rope and and pickets and stuff so we'll just talk about uh, what if you were going guided or on a glaciated mountain without crevasse so it's just very basic that we'll cover think of this as like a beginner 101 in terms of gear and packing for uh, beginner mountaineering climbs yeah so with that I'm gonna get started um, so yeah, we'll start with um, layers. Let me know if you guys can't hear me or can't see, but in terms of layers, um, we'll start with your um, undergarments. Um, most of the bigger mountains, glaciated mountains in the snow, you want to, depending on the conditions, depending on how high you're climbing, what the conditions are, um, if it's cold, you're going to be climbing something really tall with a lot of snow and it's gonna be cold, then you want to be wearing woolen um, undergarments as well or synthetic you do not ever want to wear cotton um, undergarments so wear synthetic if it is not very um, cold uh, but it's going to be very cold or you run cold because everybody's body is different get woolen undergarments um, and then uh, base layers so get base layers they're also called as long johns um, these are this is sort of a, a base layer um, and again depending on what the conditions are going to be like if it's going to be too cold then um, you want to get woolen base layers because wool also keeps you warm when you're wet and you can get wet um, not just with moisture and um, snow or rain you can get wet with your own sweat so and, and you, it's very important to stay um, dry um, so you want to get woolen or get synthetic again never um, cotton get synthetic if it is not going to be super cold if it's going to be cold get woolen ones um, both the uh, both for your legs, uh, lower body as well as upper body. Upper body, I always recommend getting something with a hood, um, so that you know you don't have to get a separate hat. And they're pretty um, they're pretty fine usually, so the helmet can easily go over the hood um, as well. And if it is really really warm, then there's something called as a sun shirt, and you can just use a sun shirt, which also always get the one with the hood because what happens is otherwise your ears get burnt on the top with the, the snow reflecting the sun back. Um, some of, uh, or, and also if you're getting the woolen ones, try to get the midweight ones because you have the lightweight, the midweight and the heavyweight. It goes in terms of I think 150 is midweight and 250 is um, heavyweight. You don't want to get heavyweight because then if you get too warm, you can't get rid of your base layer really on the mountain. So um, it's going to be super inconvenient. So get like a mid layer and get the one with a zipper, uh, at least a quarter zip so that you can unzip if you're running really hot. Because the top layers you can remove and you can just climb in your uh, base layer as well. So, so yeah, base layer is super important. And a lot of times you don't realize how hot your body will get climbing up steeper mountains. So, um, you know, so many times you can end up just climbing in your base layer as well. And as it gets, as it gets colder or if, you, or if you stop, you put on more layers. So that's about um, base layers. Um, and uh, you don't always need the lower base layer. Um, it depends on how cold you run or how cold the conditions are. If you have a beefy pant, then you are not gonna need 
uh, a base layer but it might be a good idea to keep it with you if uh, particularly if it's like a multi-day uh, expedition in the night if it's going to get super cold then you might need your uh, the the base layer for your legs as well so might as well pack it in depending on conditions and, de and depending on your body the second um, layer could either be a fleece layer or it could be an insulated layer um, a fleece layer again is not like your usual fleece that you would buy to wear at home which is usually typically very thick and bulky you have technical fleece which is uh, more fine and there's something called as a grid fleece which is even more which is even better than the normal technical fleece because they uh, sort of weave it with elastane within it and which makes it even more um, sort of breathable um, and more packable and more compressible really so um, and there are some fleece that come with like a combination of insulation and fleece where the shoulders and uh, you know some parts where you, where you if it's drizzling or raining might get wet so those are reinforced with insulated layers one of those are um, or does um, a mid layer called vigor i think uh, which has a combination of insulated for those parts where it uh, you know uh, you could get wet if it is a light rain so that is a great packable uh, mid layer I did mention um, some examples for base layers. So I would say for base layers, um, some of the brands um, that I use are Smartwool for the woolen ones or Icebreaker. And um, for the synthetic ones, I use Patagonia Capilene. Um, it's a pretty good one. And for the sun shirt, when it's really a, a very warm day, you don't really need an insulated you know, base layer or like a woolen base layer. You just need a sun shirt, then the OR Echo is a is a nice um, uh, sun shirt option as well. I mean, there's obviously a lot many more out there. Um, these are just some references that I'm giving you if you you know want to take a look at and some uh, and stuff that I have personally tried and has worked well. Um, the in the other option for a mid layer again depending on how cold or um, hot the conditions are and uh, how your body is whether you tend to run cold or warm. Um, if it is not very cold, I'll take this light uh, technical fleece. Another uh, technical fleece I have is an Architerix um, Kynite. They do a light variant and they do a, a, a slightly more heavier variant of that. What I'm wearing right now is a very light variant of um, Kynite, which uh, can be used as a base layer as well um, because it's a really, really fine fleece. But um, yeah, they do a heavier version of Kynite as well. Um, and the other uh, options for fleece, I think um, North Face also does Summit series, so they have some grid fleece. Patagonia has some uh, good grid fleece uh, as well uh, for your mid layer. And when it comes to the insulated ones, if it's going to be colder, then I take my insulated uh, mid layer instead of the fleece uh, mid layer. And uh, for those ones, I uh, I have the Patagonia uh, Nano. But something I've used before this was the North Face Thermoball as well, which is comparable or another very popular one for mid layer is um, Architerix Atom. And these are all, um, you know, if it is insulated, it has, um, and this is all synthetic uh, insulation, it has uh, ability to keep you, it's a little water resistant as well. I would say because fleece if it gets wet and then it's you know take gonna take longer it's synthetic it will not take that long but these jackets because of the synthetic um, shell it's slightly more water resistant um, as well if it's snowing etc um, the next layer uh, there's a rain jacket and there's the, the big puffy so most of the time you'll use a rain jacket at least in the Pacific Northwest we end up using a rain jacket a lot I think California you'll probably use it uh, rare, more rarely but you would use it for wind uh, potentially and what you want to look for in the rain jacket is that it should be either Gore-Tex or Portex or um, event kind of a material which should also be breathable otherwise you can get very warm very quickly uh, in um, the waterproof jackets because you know for them to serve their purpose um, they, they, it's, they are harder to obviously breathe in so you can get warm pretty quickly so look for when you look for um, rain jackets, look for the ones with zippers. You know, you can unzip so that you can you can breathe better. Um, and that's the same thing with the, the bottoms as well. Um, I'll talk about the bottoms uh, in a bit. But another thing to consider in the rain jackets is, um, you know, how many layers uh, does it have? It may have, you need at least two and a half layers 
two three layers um, uh, of the, the rain jacket for it to be beefy enough uh, to hold the rain out. Um, this one is an Architerix um, Alpha. Architerix Alpha and Architerix Zeta are some of the good ones. They tend to be pricey, but they are more foolproof than a lot of other rain jackets, which you know will hold up only for a few hours, and after that they may leak. And which is why you want to look for Gore-Tex or Pertex or uh, those kind of uh, materials and technologies. Um, some of the other good ones are um, OR Outdoor Research. Again, makes um, good ones. A really light one is Helium. Uh, helium was what I was wearing last weekend when we did a double sigh, almost 12 miles, 13 miles, and it was pouring the whole time and it did not get wet. It's very light and packable. This one is a lot more uh, beefy for like bigger mountains. Um, that's more a running jacket. It's a very light jacket if you're doing like a smaller mountain like Helen's or um, it, it, and if it's not too cold, um, uh, that should work as well. Um, Marmot also has some good... Uh, rain jackets and um so does patagonia i think torrent shell i can't remember which i think that is patagonia as well so those are some good ones too um and and you hear me mention a lot of um patagonia outdoor research architects because these are also high quality they're, they're slightly pricier but they are um, superior quality and also you know they last you a very long time rather than having to buy multiple go through multiple different um you know jackets and um yeah, uh, different pieces. It's best to get one so that uh, you can ha use that for a longer, they're more durable, durable that, that way and so more sustainable. The last layer I'll talk about in terms of your um, upper body is your um, parka or a puffy. Uh, parka is slightly longer at the back so it's where it covers a little more of your hip um, and a puffy is slightly shorter. Um, one thing to again bear in mind is to always make sure you get the one with a hood any jacket you uh, get i would always uh, recommend getting one with a hood the tendency initially when you're new to it is to get the one without a hood because it tends to be slightly cheaper but then you end up into you know uh, you realize later how important hood is particularly in a place like um, seattle where there is so much uh, precipitation here um, but also to protect you from the sun um, these jackets, since, since these are all technical, um, you know, jackets, they are built to either go properly, fit properly under your helmet or go over your helmet. So your puffy or your rain jacket hoods are designed to go over your helmet. So they are big enough to go over your helmet and then you can cinch it at the back. So once you put the hood on, once you've got the hood on uh, over your helmet, you can pull it back, um, cinch it so that it fits properly over your um, helmet basically. Now, what to look for to buy in a puffy, and this is again a pretty expensive, uh, again, piece of gear. Most of the other layers are not that expensive. Puffies are pretty expensive, typically. Um, you will usually not use this when you're climbing unless you're in a really, really cold condition or in a storm. This is for when you get to the star summit or in a, on a cold day, you have to stop or at the night. Uh, when it's, when you, cause when you stop moving is when your body will get cold and that's when you need your uh, puffy to keep you warm. What you look for in a puffy is the fill. You know, how um, how much is the fill? So there's again insulated puffies or there is down, there's a down fill or there is a synthetic fill in a puffy. And there's pros and cons of both. Um, the down uh, tends to be lighter. So the warmth to weight ratio is gonna be much better. The downside of um, a down fill puffy is that um, it can, if it gets wet, it will take a longer time to dry. So that's how some people prefer, um, and synthetic tend to be slightly cheaper as well. But um, since the job of this is to actually keep you warm and protect you, like sometimes in the night when you're really cold, I wear this and sleep in my sleeping bag, and that's what keeps me warm because otherwise it's gonna be so hard to sleep when you're so cold. Um, so it's really important for this to do the job. So I all tend to go with the down uh, puffy, even though my mid layer is synthetic. Um, this, I go with the down because I want it to be as warm as possible. Um, and what you also want to look for packability the synthetic is less packable down is more packable you can really compress it this will actually get compressed to even smaller um, size when you have so much gear you want to you know uh, look for weight of everything uh, packability and compressibility of everything so that everything fits in your pack um, as well so you want to be mindful of of that um, with that I'm gonna pause here and see if anybody has any questions on um, layers 
So if you're looking for a day hike, like yeah. St. Helens, for example, that yeah. usually you leave at 3, 4 a.m. and come back by yeah. 5, 6 p.m. Yeah. Um, so in such cases, would you recommend a puffy jacket or no? Yeah, I would. What happens on St. Helens, because the views up from the crater are absolutely stunning and gorgeous. And some of your people in your party will not want to leave till they get enough pictures. And by then you will freeze if it is a cold day. So you absolutely plus emergencies, right? Um, if somebody to take a fall and everybody needs to stick together or you're waiting for a rescue, you will run so cold so quickly and hypothermia can set in. So it's super critical. Yeah, of course, if it's running in 50s, and then you probably don't need it. But if it is um, on a cold day, depending on condition, the, weather's are, the conditions are going to be near freezing. It's like 30 degrees. When you're walking, you won't realize it. But you want to be prepared for the worst scenario in case you have to stop on the mountain or at the, the summit. So you want to have your puffy on you because and also the conditions can change like on Rainier, even if we are not going for the summit, we're just going to the base camp, Camp Muir. I will always have my big puffy, even if the forecast is for like 55 degrees, because you never know when the weather changes on a mountain like that, because it's so tall that it makes its own weather. And so many times the, the forecast is not right. So depending on where you're going, what you're doing, um, if it is uh, going to be cold, um, I would recommend, um, you know, bringing your puffy along as well. For the downfill, Ina, the question, um, I would um, say get at least an 800 um, downfill, uh, 800 or more. Anything more than that tends to be super expensive and maybe super bulky. So 800 is something, you know, you want to look for. Um, some of the good ones are... Um, the Mountain Hardware Ghost Whisperer is good. The, there's a Fitzroy. I can't remember which brand does the Fitzroy, but Architectix does Cerium. This is a Rab, uh, I think this is a Rab Neutrino or Rab Electron. Uh, Rab does good ones as well. Um, I'm pretty sure the North Face has a, a Summit down as well. So there are a few which are pretty good. Um, just to get an example. And yes, uh, Rima, Patagonia does have lifetime warranty. And, um, you know, you can absolutely um if something rips you can send it back because they're all about sustainability not throwing away gear and filling up the landfills they will repair it for free and send it back to you so if, even if it rips so many times possible with an ice axe or whatever if it rips they will do their best to repair your uh you know uh um, jacket and get it back to you all right with that um i don't see any more questions so we'll uh, keep... i have a quick question so for yeah. the like a puffy or like a, they call it like a thin sulet. So will that come in the category of mid layer or like what kind of layer? Yeah, so there are two types of puffies, right? So the mid layer is an insulated jacket. Now this is not 800 downfill. This is like your Patagonia Nano or this is more like your Atom or this is more like your uh, Thermo Ball. So this is a lighter weight, which is what you would wear. You see people wearing here on the streets as well that this one, I'll actually open it and show you. This is much bigger. And um, yeah, generally, this will have a lot more down per, you know, so, this, so the, this has a lot more loft. So this is a lot more warmer and toasty than um, the other one. Got it, got it. Right, yeah, so I this has so a lot more loft and a lot more worn as a mid layer and this one is more like a park. This is your, exactly, this is your puffy or parka. This is your outer layer, um, depending on whether you need a hard shell on the top or not. But yeah, so that's the, the difference between um, the big puffy and the, the mid layer, because uh, some people call that a puffy too, but this is the parka or the outer layer. This is the main um, warm layer. Maybe one question regarding the mid layer. Yeah. So for the mid layer, will you, uh, will you carry both fleece and the insulated? No. Either or, depending on the conditions, either or. If it is super, um, if it is super, um, if it's colder, I would take this. If it is less cold, I would take my fleece. And also my fleece is, uh, is thin and, you know, not that. So when it's spring conditions or summer conditions, so this, this fleece is not as warm as, um, you know, this is not as warm as the other one. So when it is um, very hot and 55 degrees or 60 degrees even, then I will take this. Because otherwise I'll get too hot in the other one. So I would do it either or depending on conditions and also depending on your body. Like when I started, I used to run super um, cold. So I would always have the big one. I have also climbed mountains in that big one. Now I run very hot in that because, you know, your body adapts. Um, so it depends on your body as well. You always want to, you know, be cautious. But again, if you're too hot, 
you're going to struggle uh, while you climb as well. So you got to figure that out in terms of how your body uh, responds to cold. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Piti, yeah. uh, I just had a question. Uh, you mentioned about OR echo yeah. for uh, hot day hikes. Yeah. So um, if I also get quite hot on hikes, yeah. if I'm, it's okay not to wear full sleeves um because then so you know i would still wear the reason i still wear the echo full sleeve is because to protect you from the sunburn because the snow again reflects back the sun the sun as is the radiation is a lot stronger you know every thousand feet you go up it's several degrees more stronger and then the snow reflects it back it's even stronger and even before you realize it your skin will burn and, and it will burn in a very you will be it will be painful and you will be in pain for several days so it's happened to you know when we were all starting like a friend of mine we were both she was in shorts or no she was in three fourth leggings and the part between you know the three fourth legging and till her socks was like just burnt and peeling and over day it took several days so you want to be covered fully um and that's where i would go for the full sun shirt and the hood to protect you from the sunburn on the bigger mountains yeah um let's see how we're doing on time all right so we're 20 minutes in let's keep moving um what do we talk about next uh, let's talk about gloves um gloves um liner gloves these are smart wool really uh, thin um, gloves but they're still wooden gloves because even when the trains and they're wet in the snow they will still stay warm that's why I like to use a lot of people use synthetic but I like to use wooden um, gloves because they will keep me warm even when um, you know it's uh, it's it's wet uh, synthetic if you're going to be sure it's going to be dry conditions then you wear synthetic ones more to also protect from the sun there are some really light ones so then you'll be too hot in these uh, some they or again make some gloves which are more a protection from the sun than anything else but uh, if you run cold and depending on how high you're going how cold it is um, I would highly recommend having these um, get a lighter color if it's you know too sunny like in California get the light gray ones then you want um, these other ones these are your mid-weight gloves um, these are again Gore-Tex you want them to be waterproof absolutely um, and then they have leather um, they are insulated and they have leather because the axe gets really cold, it's metal. Um, so you want these uh, uh, gloves which are Gore-Tex, waterproof and have a reinforcement uh, of leather on the palms. So um, these ones are Marmot uh, Randini and these are mid-weight and if you see the comparable ones, um, OR makes a ton of uh, good gloves. I think Aerit, I can't remember if Aerit is a mid-weight or the heavyweight, but this is what most of the time you would be wearing on the mountain. And when you go on the top and you stop or it's really, really cold or at the base camp, you know, like when you use this big puffy is when you will need probably these mitts. So the mitts, usually I don't use them to climb because they don't give you enough dexterity to hold the ice axe. So use the mitts more for, you know, on the summit if it's really cold or for an emergency or uh, in the night um, at the camp. Um, if it's really cold then you want to use these but i would default to if i'm holding an ice axe and i there's a chance of a slip and a fall or it's an exposed slope i would still use this and slip in a, a, a hand warmer inside if this is not warm enough for me because uh, this doesn't give you that kind of dexterity but these are really warm these are black time and mercury mitts so like on the base camp on um, rainier i mean i would need these absolutely It'll be super cold in the nights so the mitts is what you will need on uh, on bigger mountains you don't always need these like helens if i'm going if it's a normal day not not a stormy day then i probably wouldn't need these um, if i'm going up helens in the summer but if it, if there's a storm then i will still have these um, with me so that's about gloves um, I don't tend to use the ones which have electrical insulation and heating because anything that has a possibility of failing, you can't afford to be on a big mountain with something which has a possibility of, you know, this fails and that that mechanism didn't work. So I go with more simple and mechanical and lighter um, options and more fancy, uh, fancy stuff. Um, socks, um, coming to feet, um, again, you will need... Um, you need uh, liner socks these are woolen liner socks uh, again smart wool you also have other brands and thin socks um, and these are mountaineering socks smart wool again does make woolen socks but the mountaineering socks are a lot more thicker than your normal socks and with a reinforced uh, you know bottom because they're so hard um, 
so that's that's the reason why when you buy your boots you size up one one and a half uh, one to one and a half sizes up because these socks are so thick um, and then there's a liner socks as well so you have to make sure when you try your boots on try the boots on in a store with these socks um, and I think it's a, a logical point to talk about boots and then I can get to the pants um, boots there are double wall boots or single wall boots or whatever you know you're preparing for beginner mountains just single wall boots should be good enough and um, uh, there are three season boots or four season boots and again it depends on how cold or warm you run because um, again if you run warm you don't want your feet to get cold with your sweat so then you're better off with the three season boots but if you run cold and you're trying to do bigger mountains like you know Mount Rainier and stuff then you want to go for a four season boot or uh, my friends do rainier also in three season boots because we only climb in summer we don't climb it in winter that you need more advanced um, skill for that i bought four season boots because again i used to run very cold um and boots again i can throw out names like there's the last sportiva uh, nepal's there is scarpa mont blancs uh, there's lowas there's not many options there's a few options but it's very important to try them on because they're so hard and everybody's foot and everybody's fit of the boot is so different that you have to try them on in the store to see which one fits your foot the best and then you have to break into them because they are so hard you want you don't want to for the first time ever walk in a new mountaineering boot on a big mountain it can cost you your climb so you want to absolutely break into your boot before you do a climb um so that's about the socks that's about the boots i'm going to talk about the pants and then we'll take a pause to see if there's any questions on socks and um gloves and stuff so for the pants again uh my pant is in the laundry i wore my um my cirque or um the pants i swear by for um for climbs bigger climbs is outdoor research cirque they have both a men's and a women's version in that um and those of you i've already talked to about the pant i always rave about this it's 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 a slightly expensive pant but that's the only pant i've used for all my climbs it's very sturdy it's slightly thicker so warmer and because it's slightly thicker I've never had to use like um, long johns or uh, base layers for my legs because um, those are warm enough. They're water resistant, um, pretty water resistant. So, so that works great as well. And that's why I was wearing them last weekend because it was raining on the trail um, and that held up. I never needed to use rain pants. Um, they have enough pockets. So that's something at least um, ladies should watch out for because a lot of the pants will not have pockets. And it's so important on the mountain for your pants to have pockets to have your snacks handy and accessible um so you want to get a stuff for your phone or sometimes for your you know emergency um gear like you know stuff like your uh, communication device you want it to be in your pockets and a lot of women's pants don't have pockets uh whereas cirque does um and it has um velcro on the sides um, that you can tighten the pant which is those velcros and the straps and you, know, you don't need a separate belt and um, and so yeah so it works great and it has reinforcement around the foot where usually what happens is with your crampons you end up tearing your pants and this has a reinforced it's almost like a canvas patch that it um, you know keeps the pant protected from the uh, the crampons as well um, so that's about the pants there are other pants too but that's the one I swear by I also have um, an Architerix Gamma which is lighter so on a very hot summer day I would use the Architerix Gamma um, but otherwise I swear by all bigger mountains uh, I swear by um, Cirque OR and um, oh, the rain pants the rain pants you don't want to invest a lot of money like the the Architerix uh, rain jackets tend to be the best their Gore-Tex tends to be really good um, so their pants are pretty good too but then they'll be super pricey and you don't want to invest in that because like I said the crampons will tear them or when you're glissading, you know, you will go through definitely more than one if you plan to keep doing uh, mountaineering and climbing, keep climbing mountains. Um, you don't want to risk a cramp on catching a $400, $500 pant. So go with, I would go with, you know, the REI pant is like $100 or so, or Patagonia makes one too. Um, and I bought it in a, in a sale, so I got that for around that price as well. But what you want to look for in it is they should have side zippers all the way from the top to the bottom. And the reason you need that is to be able to put on your uh, crampons because you don't always start your climb from the trailhead in crampons. You keep going up till the point on the mountain it gets icy is when you need to put on your crampons. And then you, uh, if you're already wearing your crampons, um, and 
if you want to glissade down well even if you glissade down then you have to remove your crampons but a lot lot of the times if it starts raining uh, you want to wear your pants over your crampons so you should be able to open up the zip on the side and then put the pant on still with your boot on because if they don't have those zips um the mountain boots are so big that the pant will not go through even if it's a small zip it will not be enough for it to go through your mountaineering boot plus if it is with the crampon as well so you want a full zip um from top to bottom that you can open up the pant and then you can wear it um and again i couldn't find where my pant is but you should keep the zipper in between when you pack it you keep it open on the top and keep keep it open at the bottom so that it's only tied here and it's easy to put the boot the leg in and then you zip it down so when you pack it you pack it with your zip open from the top and open from the bottom and hanging at the center so you put your leg through it and then you zip up so you're not wasting time zipping down figuring out putting leg through i do i need to zip open more and open more and get it up and then or oh, the zip has come off completely <laughs> so just leave it in the center so that you are more efficient on the on the mountain sometimes you'll have to put it on on a steep slope so you want to be efficient in terms of how you pack it um with that i'm going to pause there um we're 30 minutes in so we can take questions now uh maybe i'll cover head or no let's see let's see if anybody has questions on the pants on the gloves or socks or boots uh what was the first layer of glove you mentioned what it's, was that it's a it's a smart wool and that's just one of the brands but what's important is to get a woolen uh base layer i would say the the liner glove or uh some their fleece ones as well they are warm too my preference is wool because um it will be warm even if it is wet So these ones are smart wool. Okay, cool. Uh, what is your suggestion on wearing hats? Yes, I will come to the hat next. Uh, Architectrix Beta. Uh, Ritika, I had first got an Architectrix Beta, and it could be just that one piece could have been defective, but the seams were leaking. When I tested on a hike, it was raining. After a couple hours, the seams were leaking inside. Um, so that's when I went and got an Alpha. um and when i look at the reviews now i see the zeta is rated pretty high i didn't see a mention of be uh, beta so i don't know if it was just my piece that was uh, defective or beta is generally not as doesn't hold up just as well as alpha or zeta does so do some more research around beta um for mount sai last week yeah what i wore for mount sai was again outdoor research helium H E L I U M. It was a helium, which was really light. It's actually running jacket. It's very, very light, very packable, and yet I was like dry. Um. Okay, I don't see any more. So let's go to the hats. So hats again. Um. This is again a smart wool hat. So it's a woolen hat. Um. But it's not. It doesn't keep you. It doesn't make you very hot. Um. It's a woolen hat. It's great for both cold and hot conditions. um i couldn't find a lighter color but cuz i usually use hats more for sun protection than anything else and then the helmet goes over this so i can still put my hat on it's more for sun protection and then your helmet as a place to lose uh, loosen the uh, the ring inside and then you put it over your hat and then you can tie it down so this still protects you from if it's raining it helps as well or it helps um if um there is sun it helps with that as well so you can still you want to get a hat that your helmet will go over um if it is sunny or if it's raining but if it is a very cold um condition that you're going in then get like a thin uh, woolen hat cuz the other beanies and all that you see your helmet is not going to go over so get like really thin smart wool makes uh, and some of the other people make as well there's fleece ones as well i would get a really thin woolen um hat but again my preference is not to add another piece of gear and which is why i should make sure my base layer and all my jackets have a hat i just put that in and i put it over and the helmet over the hat so i don't usually have another hat to carry unless it's super sunny then i carry um this kind of a hat rather than a woolen hat i generally never have a woolen hat or or if you're taking uh, something in the night you think you're going to be cold you can take a hat for the night if you're spending a night on the mountain um then take a hat for that but there again i just end up wearing my puffy and the hood and i sleep cuz your sleeping bag also has like a place to tuck your head in so yeah i generally don't have a woolen hat but a lot of people do talking about hats i'll also say there's another piece i don't have here is a buff i don't know if you all know what a buff is it's like a tubular uh, piece of cloth which you can pull over your head face and then you know you wear it around your neck it keeps your neck um 
warm and you can pull it over your nose and your mouth so it's a buff um, um, you can use that to protect you from sun you can use a lighter version of that or you can use a warmer version of that to protect you from the cold as well because a lot of the times nose gets really cold breathing and your mouth gets very cold because um, everything else is covered but this part gets cold so the buff helps with that and if it's really cold um, get a balaclava um, it's like a monkey cap you used to have um, in India so so that's for the head um, a list of other recommended products at the end of this session I shall try to pull that together actually you know what we'll do I'm recording the session I'll get my team to do a blog um, on this and then uh, we'll email it out with the recording um, put your helmet over that okay I think now what was the question can you put helmet over uh, bucket hats? What's a, by a bucket hat, do you mean like a baseball hat? Or you mean the thin, I'm not sure what a bucket hat is. Whose question was that? Uh, it was Matthew Strong, Matt. I find a picture. So All right. Google bucket hat is like with the round thing. Like a hat with a round thing. So oh, like a cricket umpire hat? Yeah, something like that. Okay. So, I think I'll have to see the picture to see whether it will fit inside a helmet or not. No, All I, right. I, I think the helmet will go over it and the, the flap, like Saturn's rings, will come around it. <laughs> Alright, so I'll keep, I'll keep going. Um, and then, what, what else do we want to talk about? Uh, shall we talk about the... Yeah, the helmet. Let's talk about the helmet. We're going to talk about the head um some of the helmets again your bike helmets and um uh, you know other helmets are not gonna work you want to use a mountaineering um, helmet um this is one of the most basic ones but i don't think you need anything more than that it's a black diamond uh half dome and there are some other ones um pretzel mix i think pretzel boreo or something which is like lighter they've got bigger holes so it's lighter um so once you get really conscious about weight and everything and it's not a lot more expensive so yeah those are some of the options but you don't have to get too fancy with helmets it does the job um yeah a helmet whenever you wear an ice axe you want to bring your whenever you get your ice axe out get your helmet out uh basically because it means you have your axe out because there's a chance to take a fall um so that means you need your helmet on as well so whenever you get your axe out get your helmet out um which brings us to let's talk about the axe and then we can talk about uh, the crampons so the technical gear so this is the ice axe I use. Um, the ice axe that you will buy, there are a couple, there is a Petzl, um, P-E-T-Z-L uh, ice axe you can buy, or there is, a, this is a Black Diamond Raven, a Raven Pro, it's slightly lighter, so this is a Black Diamond Raven Pro. Um, and the ice axe when you buy is depending, get the right size for your height. Uh, and there is some, you know, you can read it up online, it shouldn't um, touch the, the ground, it should be a few inches above the ground. Um, so it shouldn't be too long um, for you. So get the right, I think it's 75 centimeters, 70 and 85 centimeters. So depending on your height, get the right axe, which is right for you. Um, and this is just a cover for, uh, you know, the sharp edges. And then crampons um, to for your uh, glaciated uh, climbs. The crampons, again, there can be a 10 point crampon. There could be a 12 point crampon. Um, what I have is a 10 point crampon and then they can be um, they can be an automatic or a semi-automatic crampon or they could be a, a wrap around what are they called um, the so they've got the strap so you can tie them around so these are those um, the tie around uh, crampons they're not automatic or semi-automatic because those are slightly heavier I was very focused on weight um, so I got these gravels and I think these are 10 points so points is basically you know the teeth how many teeth does it have so some of them have 10 some of them have um, 12 um, some companies are okay with getting 10 or 12 point crampon some guiding companies say you have to get a 12 point crampon get a steel crampon because some of them are aluminium so they can break if you're walking on a rock like there's a section on Rainier um, called the disappointment fever where you could be walking on the crampon with a crampon on rocks so it can break um, so yeah, so these are Gravels, Gravels G10 or G12, um, depending on how many uh, uh, teeth they have. Uh, and these are the wraparound uh, crampons, but they're automatic and semi-automatic. The only thing to be aware of is if you're getting automatic or semi-automatic ones, your boot needs to be a mountaineering boot and it needs to have those, you know, it, it's called a lip or a, um, that edge where those will fit in. 
whereas a strap on can go on even on your um you know hiking boots like if it's a very hot day on helens late summer you're climbing helens and there's still snow there but it's too hot um then you probably don't want to be wearing uh, your four season mountaineering boots your uh, you'll be too hot so you just wear your hiking boot and these it can still take these um these crampons and this is um you get a bag you get other bags as well this is a black diamond bag for the um crampon because some backpacks have a section to put your crampons on the outside um but because um i put it inside my bag i got this bag so that it doesn't rip my jackets or my sleeping bag so i got a bag for that but you don't really have to buy a bag something like this works just fine because um if it goes inside this it's got the you know the Oh, this has got rust right now but the bubble wrap inside so i took a lot of times um because it's more in the shape is more flexible it can fit in wherever in from my pack i just use that i a lot of times even though i invested in a, a bag i don't usually use it um because this is easier to fit into my bag um so that's about the technical um gear uh, if you're doing a roped climb you will need a harness as well so somebody here in the group was doing um baker so baker you will be roping up because there will be crevasses and you will need a harness um and harness is something that you will put on and um you will be tied to a rope through your harness there will be carabiners um on your harness and um so you need a harness uh, as well and harness again when getting a harness i would think i would um, you know consider the weight of the harness but i would also consider the lightest ones like the black diamond colwar it's pretty light but it's it's kind of thin so if you want to get into say rock climbing afterwards um then it might not be the most comfortable one for rock climbing so the and and rock climbing harnesses mountaineering harnesses doesn't matter um get a harness consider the weight but also see if you want to do rock climbing in future just get one which will work for um for both that's kind of what i looked into plus this one is a petzel one it was on sale at that time so i just went with this um and then you want a locking carabiner or triple lock a triple action locking uh, carabiner um i think petzel makes one uh, i'm sure there's others too uh, is what the guides ask you to bring so that the rope gets connected to that triple locking carabiner on your um, on your harness so that's pretty much about unless you're doing courses like crevasse rescue and self rescue you will then need prusix and more carabiners and stuff like that as you get more advanced but i don't think there's any need for getting into all of that um i think before then getting into the backpacking gear for 42 minutes in i'll just quickly cover you want lights um you want at least one headlamp at least 300 lumens this one is a petzel uh, tikka but i think after this they got another one petzel actic or something which i think 400 or 450 lumens and that is rechargeable as well um you uh, this is this black diamond storm which is also more or spot and storm or both um they are more than 300 lumens as well you want to carry one of these plus you want to have spare batteries a lot of the times you will have an alpine start so make sure you have the right sized uh, the right number of a spare battery as well because you don't want it to fail um the other stuff i will have is obviously i definitely have on bigger mountains don't ever forget this is a foot warmer i always keep it for emergency in my uh, bag and i always keep a couple of hand warmer uh, packets in my bag you never know what happens when the weather turns around or you have to spend the time on the mountain more than you know what you expected um sunscreen um this is pretty big i won't carry the whole thing but when it comes to sunscreen you want to think about the sunscreen which has zinc in it um so as to provide enough protection against the strong radiation up on the mountain i usually get a small travel tube and i put the sunscreen in that and just carry that rather than this whole thing cuz you want to be counting ounces um pink sport is a good one so is dermatone don't only get the sunscreen also get the lip balm uh with the zinc and for um you know at least 50 p uh spf protection um cuz and don't forget to keep applying it every hour otherwise the burn can be really bad on 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 bigger mountains so always remember to apply your sunscreen and get like a dermatone or a um or a thing sport which um will hold up against that strong radiation i think with that um uh, also always carry uh, in addition to your um essentials i carry a battery pack um in a ziploc pouch so it doesn't get wet with of course the charging cable as well cuz my navigation is typically on my phone um so a battery pack and the the charging cable 
Oh, and oh, with the boots, I missed um, the, for the legs, the gaiters. So these are gaiters, they're in a bag because these are dirty, they've got a lot of dirt on them. But you wear gaiters over your pants so that um, the snow and dirt doesn't go into um, onto your pants. So you wear those gaiters over your um, over your pants and then they get uh, latched onto your boot and strapped under your boot. Um, I think the last thing, or we can cover this along with uh, the backpacking stuff, but any questions so far? Let's have a look. Which battery pack do you use? I use Anchor. I've had one which I bought off of Amazon. Well, this is also off of Amazon, but another one I had bought off of Amazon failed me a couple of times on, um, to, twice on Camp Muir in a whiteout, and that's my navigation. So then I researched which is the best one out there, and I've uh, never had any problem with uh, Anchor. Yes, uh, good idea. Uh, without a leash for an ice axe, um, I would recommend getting an ice axe. I, uh, 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 a leash, I'm sorry, for your ice axe. Um, I have never used it, um, it's your choice, but if you're not confident of your grip on your axe or if you think something happens and you might lose your axe and um, you know you can't afford to lose your axe, then absolutely, like if you're climbing Mount Hood, I would absolutely have a leash because um, you absolutely need those tools, otherwise without that, it will be almost impossible to climb down that mountain. But if I'm on Baker or Rainier, I don't really need a leash, I mean I have my uh, axe and I'm, I have a very, I'm holding on to it with my life, so I don't have a leash. But yes, uh, by all means, go and uh, uh, get a leash if that makes you comfortable. But yeah, just get used to it. If you're tying it to your belt or whatever, make sure it doesn't come into, you know, you just get used to that leash um, hanging on to you as well. Um, what else? Looking for enough charge. Vicky, what about the bag? Yeah, we'll come to that now. That's the last piece left. Do we need harness for Shasta climb as well? Um, yes, because usually when we climb Shasta, we did not rope up, but the guiding company, the California Silicon Valley, Asha folks are going with, they have told me that the seep section that they have, they're going to put you all on, um, on a rope. But I think a, a harness is um, included in your package. I can double check that, but I think your ISAX harness, harness is actually included in your, uh, in your package, so you don't have to get a separate harness. Pretty the guide email said they will include the harness. So. They will, right? Yeah. 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 Thanks. Sure. Thank you. What else? Um, just looking at the questions. Uh, Swapnil, do we need harness for Shasta? They're dropping out now. Check later. Okay. So we'll move on. I think we're doing good in time. We have another 30 minutes to talk over the backpacking and stuff. So for those of you spending um, on a, going on a multi-day expedition, like more than a one day, if you're spending a night on the mountain, um, you definitely want a bigger pack. You want at least, uh, at least, so if you ask the guys, it'll be like at least a 65 liter pack. Um, 65 to 75 liter pack is what the guys will ask you to get. I think this one is Actually, a 50 liter pack. The guys are not happy that I got a 50 liter pack because they will also want to give you food, uh, shared gear, rope sometimes, and parts of tent. Um, but if you're an ultra efficient packer, you can get by with 50, 55. Um, I went for a 50 because um, I know I pack like really tight. Um, but also because that forces me to count my ounces, forces me to like, I will not take a hat if I don't need a hat. So that just forces me to make sure I have, I'm most efficient in terms of gear and then I'm not carrying an unnecessary weight. Um, but that is a slippery slope. So just be careful if that will work for you or not. If you want to be on the safer side, get like a 60 liter, 60, 65 liter pack, but just be mindful of the tendency to fill in, to fill it. Um, in terms of packs, different types of packs. The one I have is, um, this is an Osprey Aura. The men's version is, I think, called Atmos. Um, the other, this is not exactly a mountaineering pack, but works great because it's not that heavy um, for the comfort and the functionality it offers. But a lot of the mountaineers go with the mountain um, hardware packs or uh, hyper light packs or black diamond packs, um, which have separate bases for ice axe. You can put an ice axe on this as well, which have a separate pocket for um, crampons. You don't really need it. Because my, my problem with the mountain hardware and the black diamond ones was that I was used to Osprey packs for my other day hiking pack and they have very well padded um, shoulder straps. And the, the other ones to just really make them really light, the mountaineering packs, with 40 pounds I felt like the shoulder straps were biting into my shoulders and I wanted to be comfortable in the mountain and this was probably a few ounces heavier, maybe a pound heavier, so I decided to go with this. Uh, but there are options out there, I mentioned a few, if you do your research you'll find um, others as well. Um, so with that, uh, let's talk about packing. 
you there's something called as um, contractor bags or um, gorilla bags. So these are like heavy duty trash bags. You want to line your bag with these before you start packing them. And the reason being, you know, the rain cover, it serves the purpose of the rain cover, but a rain cover on a mountain, when it's windy, it's just going to either fly off or it's going to be messy. It's not going to be easy to manage. Um, this is a better way to manage and keep your, uh, a, a more sure shot way of keeping your gear dry. So you line it. It's not like a normal trash bag. It's more, a lot more um, sturdier than that. So you line it with the, the bag before you start filling it in. And the way you fill it in, you always put the, the bulky, heavy, bigger items at the bottom. So I would put my sleeping bag and my big puffy also because I don't need them unless I'm at the camp. So I put them at the bottom. The other beauty of this pack, why I love this pack is because the bottom part opens up separately. So the stuff that I don't need and the bottom lighter stuff like my sleeping bag and my puffy are here always. So I don't have to go at the bottom even at the camp or at the top of the summit to reach my big puffy. So it's always here and my sleeping bag is here. I think at this point before I start packing my pack, I'm going to talk about my sleeping bag because there's a knack to packing a sleeping bag because these are so big. Um, so sleeping bags again on the bigger mountains like Shasta and Baker and Rainier, you want something between 0 and 20 degrees um, and they want them to be packable enough. Because um, the synthetic ones, get the ones that you would typically use for camping, they can be super bulky and they're going to be super hard to pack and they can get heavy. So you look for the fill again and then you look for the packability of it and the warmth to weight uh, ratio. Um, and again, something to keep in mind is there is a difference in women's bodies. Around, I think the, stati the, the statistic is 9 or 11 degrees colder than men's bodies. So if I buy a 15 degree REI Magmine men's, it's going to be those 9 degrees colder. The women's REI Magma 15 degree, they're both rated 15 degree, but there's a difference in the warmth. The women's uh, bag is going to be 9 or 11, whatever that number is, degrees warmer because women's body run colder. So, so that is something to keep in mind. Uh, if you um, are a female, don't go for a men's sleeping bag. Whereas if you are a male, you can think, consider if you're counting ounces, when you talk about a sleeping pad, you can get a women's sleeping pad because it's a few inches smaller. It doesn't matter if your feet are hanging outside as long as your body is warm. So it's lighter because women's ones are shorter. Um, but we'll talk about the sleeping uh, pad as well. But that's about the bags. I have an Aria Magma. Mountain Hardware makes some good ones as well. But there again, there's synthetic and down. I went with the synthetic because I again wanted everything to fit in my 50 liter pack. So this is really, really packable. Um, it goes down as small as this and maybe I should start packing it. Otherwise I won't be able to pack my bag. Um, so yeah, look at that. The synthetic ones are harder to, they don't pack down as much as the these ones will, um, the down ones will. So I went with the down one, but a lot of people use the synthetic one as well. And you want a compression sack. You want a waterproof compression sack because you do not want your, whatever happens, you do not want your sleeping bag to get wet. You need to stay dry through the night. Um, so this is an, an event. This is a Sea to Summit um, compression sack the bags these come in they will not compress down to what they're supposed to compress down to so you need a compression sack to fit them in and then cinch them down to like really small so you can fit everything in your bag and the way to do that like when i started i tried to roll them in the nicest possible way and i couldn't pack it down the only way to do it is to just keep pushing it in and shoving it in till the whole thing goes in um and that's a, the most efficient way I have realized to pack it. A lot of people pack their bags. A lot of guides pack their bags just like this as well. They just put their jackets also just shove it in like that. Because um, these things are very compressible. Um, but that's a way to pack sleeping bag. Because this, I really struggled my first couple of climbs. And then I learned the only way to do it is to just shove it in. So I just wanted to do that. In the meanwhile, while I do this, does anybody have questions? And maybe instead of typing while I pack this, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question. It looks like you're putting a genie in a bottle. It is. That is exactly what it is. And you want to be efficient, right, with this um, as well. Because, um, well, usually you break your camp after you're done with the climb. But sometimes, you know, um, the time is of essence and you want to be able to. And then if you're struggling to wrap it and get it back in and you're exhausted after you've done your climb, it can be so painful and frustrating. <laughs> So I would say get a compression sack, learn how to pack it in and pack it down, do it a couple of times till you get a hang of it. 
Um, so yeah, that's that. While I'm still packing this. Aria is also now with the magma, they gives like a tool sack, like a bigger storage sack, and then like yes, the yes, sack. yes, and that's a good point, Swapna, because when you store them, don't leave it in a compression sack. When you come back, because you want to preserve its loft, because the loft keeps the uh, gives the warmth. So as soon as you come back, you put it in the bigger pack that it came in. Same with your puffy. You don't keep it small, compressed. Like I'll compress this down even a lot more to pack it. Um, but you don't want to do that um, uh, when you come back. You want to open it up and hang it loose so that it, the loft comes back and it retains its warmth. So yeah, you don't want to keep it compressed and packed like that always, even after your expedition. So basically, that's the idea. You tie it make sure this is waterproof and then it has straps on the side so while i still do this and i'm gonna get this up and i'm gonna cinch the straps down they all have uh, uh, these buckles on the side and the straps to pull down and tighten it you'll see when i do it but in the meantime i'll talk about the sleeping pads now sleeping pad are important because um, your sleeping bag doesn't have the insulation um, to, uh, to prevent the cold from the ground uh, coming to your body. So you use a sleeping pad, um, you, you would have seen those foam ones. This is an inflatable one called Thermarest. Um, and they are really, they, like it's so small, otherwise you would have seen those big yoga mat style ones which you, you know, kind of have to round down and attach under your bag. Um, they're not even as warm those are probably two r value there's something what is an r value you want to see an r value and get something which is at least three or more in r value um this one is a thermarest neo light neo air light so this is 4.5 r value anything more than that i would say you might get too hot uh, if it's a summer climb so you don't usually um you know there's a um, there's a x term I don't generally go with the recommend the XM because it gets too hot. Um, I went with the 4.5 R value because I use it for my camping um, as well around the year. All right, so once this is done, this goes in, then you just pull down the straps. You just keep pulling the straps down from all the sides and this should become at least half of the size that it is, if not a third. So that's why you need compression sacks. Some people use compression sacks even for their clothes and jackets and the big puffy and stuff but generally it's not needed but you'll see how this is going down in size um at some point when i'm desperate i sit on it and pull it down as well but basically you just wrestle your way to get it as small as possible so yeah with that i think we're ready to pack this in it's not the smallest it can be but in the interest of time i'm going to work with this and it goes at the bottom the reason this goes at the bottom the heavy stuff and again i have a separate liner bag here because this is already waterproof this bag but i just want to make sure my gear stays um dry because this is a separate compartment and my bigger trash bag is not coming down here so i have a separate bag here i'll put this in really i've seen people putting their um sleeping bags i think i could be completely wrong outside the no because you never no. wanted to get wet Tent, yeah. sometimes they put on the outside, okay, uh, but not a uh, sleeping bag because you want it to be dry. It's so important for it to be dry. So you would put it in. Um, and then, well, these are what I would wear, but I would always have a spare sock with me, either for sleeping or if this is to get wet. And I would use that to go uh, put into the fill in the gaps. You want to be efficient with your packing. Wherever there's a gap, you tuck stuff into the gaps in the corners. So there are these little things that, you know, like your um, warmer. So just make sure you have no empty space and it is fully packed. So I would do that. I would also put the gloves that I want accessible. I would just put those or my mitts. Maybe my mitts can go here. They should have ideally gone inside the, um, the carry bag. But yeah, for now, I'll just do it like this. So yeah, all my um, bulky stuff is down. And what that does is also protects my back because I don't want the heaviest part uh, items like my crampons which are pretty heavy. I don't want them at the bottom. So bottom you put the bulky things which protects your lower back. And then I would start putting these in. Like I would put my crampons into one side. I would put my harness on the other side. 
and then just keep pressing them down and there is a compression sack for this also but for now I'm just gonna or you can open it and just shove it in as well but for now I'm just gonna do it this way roll them put them in I would probably be wearing one of these so I'll just put this in and the another way of doing it is you would I typically when I'm packing it properly I would just roll it the whole way so it's really compact so I kind of roll them like this and then I have this and the carabiner and the um, the harness and the uh, crampons all kind of fit in at the same level and I'm not putting them one over the other till the whole bag is kind of stuffed at that level I would be wearing my base layer so I don't need that I put this on the this way so that I can pull it out easily rather than in between all those rolled up layers and so yeah this would go in here and oh something I didn't have a chance to touch upon is a medical kit this is a very big medical kit your guides or leads will carry something like this but I want you to all go check up on Amazon there's something called as or at REI any other store adventure medical first aid kits and you can get individual person two day three day or multiple people two day three day they're much smaller and then you can fit them inside you should always have your own uh, medical kit um, easily accessible and then you should also have um, any medication that you need to take um, on your I would put the gaiters if I'm not wearing most of the time I'll be wearing these gaiters actually before I start um, I would have put this in here as well because you see the gap here I would stuff it in so that there is no extra space left Your packing reminds me of when I would leave India to come to US and get as much stuff as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and which is why if you don't think you can, you know, wrestle with your bag and get everything in like this, get a 60 liter bag. But basically, you don't want to be leaving now. There is space here. And this is where I'll start putting, I usually carry some wipes. Um, so I'll start putting them all the way here in the side. So there's no space left anywhere. And before you start packing, I will loosen all these compression straps on the side. Pack this really well, whatever I need. And there's still like plenty of space in my pack at the top. What I'm gonna do on the top is I'm gonna put my food here on the top so that it's accessible. My breakfast stuff or my lunch stuff that I want accessible and I put that and on top of that I would put my helmet so that you're using that space for the food to go inside that. And then press it in, press all of it in so that there's no extra space anywhere. Wrap it up properly so that there's no scope of water going inside and cinch it. Now one thing I missed, which you want to do before you start packing your pack, I missed my excuses because I'm on a webinar, is the water. I first always fill in the water and put the three liter of water in because after that, after put That's stuff, there's no way it's going to go in. to say, when is she going to put her water bladder? <laughs> they should have gone first. I forgot. It's going to be, and this is empty. Once it's filled, it's going to be impossible to get it in. So I fill it in, put it at the bottom. Some of the guys put it on the top as well. And that's one way of doing it. But I like to put it in its own, um, you know, because this bag has its own uh, pocket. So I put it in that pocket and make sure this is hanging outside. Um, so just talking about that, I use a platypus. Um, the reason I use that, because the ones which uh, with the opening on the top, I feel like are a little cumbersome in filling and cleaning. This one has a Ziploc on the top, which opens up. And this is like a, like a Ziploc. So it's easier to open, empty, clean, fill. Um, so that's kind of what um, I use. It's called a platypus. Um, and the spout here locks. So it doesn't leak. So sometimes it's happened that the hose was outside and I put something on it and the whole water's leaked out. 
so and the car is wet so this you can lock so that the water doesn't leak out so you want to get that in first and then what you want to make sure is you have your um things that you need accessible right so you so first you close this you cinch all the straps you cinch all the side um, straps the reason is push everything in first before pulling the side straps is so that it's not wonky and wobbly and it's like straight it helps with your balance if your pack is properly packed, packed right otherwise it's you know sometimes you'll see this side is sticking out the other side is sticking out um, then you can be a little wobbly especially if you're crossing ladders or crevasses you want your balance to be perfect the other thing to mention without uh, regarding packing is um, if your crampon is on this side and you have a Nalgene bottle, and I'll go grab my Nalgene, I don't know where my Nalgene is. Um, on the other side, so the weight is balanced. If you have your crampon and the Nalgene on the same side, because the water tends to be really heavy and crampons are heavy too, and then you have your harness on the same side as well, then invariably you'll, your one side will start cramping or getting tired sooner. So you want to balance your weight as well. If your crampons are here, your harness should be here, or you know your bottle should be, try to balance the weight on both sides. So one part, one side of your body, your leg is not uh, taking more um, stress. So that's that. And then on the top goes, um, I think something we didn't cover is my Glacier um, sunglasses. Um, because of the radiation being so strong, you really need to protect your eyes. These are Jogos. Jogos are great Glacier sunglasses, Glacier glasses. Um, and these are, I think, which ones are these? These are Explorer and you need at least spectrum three um and i get them with these so that you know i'm not losing them they're pretty expensive as well so yeah these are jalbos these are glacier glasses um some people also use it's just one climb and you are a snowboarder or a skier you can use your goggles as well um but if you're going to do more than one climb then just invest in good glacier um glasses and if you wear uh, spectacles you get cocoons as well which will go over your glasses so these i keep them handy at the very top and then I keep my power bank. Um, I keep my um, shit here. I keep a um, headlamp and the extra batteries. And then what I do is with my sunscreen, I keep it accessible in these waist uh, pockets. So that every hour and some snacks, some bars in these pockets, so they're accessible. They'll be, oh, this is the tube for sunscreen. I fill this, it, uh, this in and keep it in. And this is the lip balm, the Dermaton, and I'll keep it here. So this is easily accessible. And I'll have some snacks here, like my goo shots um, or gels or some, you know, snack that I want handy because you want to be snacking every hour or so will be here. Some of the snacks will also be on my pan pockets. Um, and especially bars tend to freeze if it's really cold your body warmth will keep them um, from freezing uh, or or get the bars which will not freeze this is something i'll wear um, get the bars that will not freeze like a lara bar or there's few others as well which will not freeze but yeah the back is pretty much ready i didn't talk about this this is a wag bag you're not supposed to uh, you know leave any um, trash in your poop back on the mountain so this is actually uh, a wag bag or a blue bag that you poop inside and there is some co uh, compounds inside which will kind of keep it in there it seals up there is usually a little toilet paper and sanitizer in there um, so you use that on a mountain because you got to pack it out i like the osprey pack because it has this mesh outside so i'm packing out my poop in this mesh rather than putting it inside uh, my bag basically so that's what i use it for depending on how many days you're going for don't get the impression that you're not going to have food, you'll have your poop, <laughs> so it'll still be the same. That was a bad joke, but how do you put your um, ice axe onto your pack? Um, you want it to be here and not sticking out like this, that pokes someone. And the way to do that so that it doesn't slip out is there is a strap here. So these straps are for ice axe or for your poles. You put it through this and then you turn it back. It's not never going to slide down. Yeah, and then there is a strap to tie it to on the side. I don't know if you guys can all see this. There's a strap here, and I will tie it onto my strap and tighten it up so it sticks to. So that's how I would tie my um, ice axe to my backpack, and then I would get my poles to go either on the same loop here and on this. Sometimes you're carrying um, pickets which go here. 
but there is place on an osprey bag there's at least place to put your um, poles even here so I will put them here and tie it down over here so yeah so that's how we'll get the everything anything that is sharp should be outside the pack whether it's tent poles can go outside um, the because anything that can damage your gear goes outside so all the sharp stuff goes outside and and we're ready so which expedition are we going on all right so that was pretty much packing and let's see who's got questions we're running a little over but let, we can take a few questions um oh food is a completely different session altogether Riva. uh can you post a link to the first aid kit um yes lata it's called adventure medical and what we'll do is um you guys can go and subscribe um, on our website. What we do is every time we do a webinar, my team writes up a blog. Um, so this is getting recorded. So they'll write up a blog and it will be on our website and which will have all these um, details in there, but it's called Adventure Medical. Thank you, thank you, Preet. Sure. Where does the food go on a multi-day camping pack? Yeah, so again, um, that's a good question because the food that I need, I put it under my helmet right at the top. Um, in the sides um, is where I would put my freeze dry. There's still plenty of room in this. I haven't really, you know, packed it very well. There's still plenty of room in this for stuff to go. You know, all this, there's so much space here. Um, it will go on the sides. Um, but yeah, you know, some people, what they do is they get these, um, uh, what do they call the sacks to put the food, um, right? And if you put all the food in one sack, I don't think that's the most efficient way to pack it. I would do like smaller sacks or smaller Ziploc pouches because then you can use all those pockets of space. Like there'll be one space will have where I'll have all my snacks in like a smaller pouch and one space where if I'm carrying like a pizza or a parantha or a bagel will be in another pocket so that I'm using the space properly. If it's like a one big thing, then you're not most efficient with your packing your pack and using up all the space. But I would put it in different pockets in the bag. Wherever there is space, I'll just um, squeeze it in. All right, what else? Nice job packing. Thank you. That's what the guides told me when they were giving me a demo. They got me to do the demo instead. Because <laughs> they said you can never pack in a 50 liter pack. <laughs> but yeah, don't go by that. Uh, you know how efficient you can be with your packing. So get a bigger pack if you need. Um, where would the tent go? Now that's a good question, right? So you usually share a tent. Now, because I have a 50 um, liter pack, a tent doesn't fit in. I mean, I can still fit it in on the side because um, tent usually you divide it into three parts. There'll be the poles. I usually take the poles and I put them on the side on the outside because you don't worry about them getting wet. And the folks who have the bigger packs, I give them, somebody takes the main tent, somebody takes the fly, which is the rainproof part of it. But right now, the way my pack is, there's still plenty of room, even for the tent um, on the top. I can take one part of it, which is the fly, but usually you're sharing between two or three people. We were sharing between three people before prior to COVID days. Um, so we had the, somebody had the fly, somebody had the, the body of the tent and somebody had the poles and I was a poles person. So hope that answers. Uh... Also the big mouth bottles, yeah, they're called Nalgene, N-A-L-G-E-N-E. -E. Um, I'm trying to see if I can grab, I probably, there should be one in each of my cars. And the, one of the Nalgenes is a, is a reflective one, so in the night it's easy for me to find where it is as well. Um, so Nalgenes are the wide mouth bottles, the reason you want them is sometimes your hose will freeze. Some people buy uh, an insulation for the hose. I don't do that because um, what I do is I put it inside my jacket and with my body warmth, it stays warm. But since I'm taking that chance, because um, I'm counting ounces, what I do is um, I take a Nalgene always because a white, it's wide mouth, so it doesn't freeze. The water in a Nalgene doesn't freeze. And also you never want to put electrolyte tabs, noon in this, because I think it messes with the, the plastic. Uh, we always put the noon tablets, the electrolytes in the Nalgene. So I keep that separate for, um, so yeah, they're called Nalgene's wide mouth uh, bottles. Um, what else? Which battery pack? I think we covered that. All right, so what else? There's four new questions. Speaking with size yeah. compression sack, did you use for your sleeping bag? Yeah, that is a very good question. I spent so much time figuring out which size to use. You try to see the guidance. Uh, you know, it will say, it will have guidance on the compression sack or on your sleeping bag, it will have a guidance saying you need a 20 liter compression sack or a 10 liter compression sack for your sleeping bag. 
Um, I can check what I have. I don't know if it's safe. Um, because I actually went into REI. Um, that's where I was buying my sleeping um, bag. So I actually tried to fit it in and got them to show me if it will fit in. Because um, the whole idea is to get it right sized so you can compress it down as much as you need. Unfortunately, I can't see what size this was. But yeah, that is something you definitely want to talk to whoever, you know, um, is the, or do some research online because um, I can't remember how many liters and I don't find it on it. But yeah, that is something you want to be very careful about because um, every, the, if I had a synthetic sleeping bag, I don't think it would have fit into this. I would have needed a bigger compression sack. So the size of that is very important uh, and it is dependent on which sleeping bag you have and how bulky that is. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, would hydration bladder freeze? Bladder generally doesn't freeze um, and not on, well, you know, um, oh, you mean the hose. The hose freezes. The bladder is inside your pack is generally fine. That doesn't freeze. The hose freezes. And on Shasta, and Shasta is actually no joke because it's like 14,000 feet, right? It's pretty tall. Um, it can freeze if it is cold conditions, but you're down in California. If you're climbing end of May, early June, see what the temperatures are like. If they're nowhere near freezing, obviously if it's in 50s or even 40s, it's not going to freeze. But if it is freezing, then it can freeze um, and that's when you want to either get an insulation um, for your hose or you make sure you have it inside your jacket the hose uh, to keep it another trick people do is every time you've done drinking water they blow it back all the way so that there's no water left in the hose for it to freeze so that's another trick people follow Preeti, when you are taking your backpack on uh, flights, do you usually check it in or take it in with you? How does that work? Yeah, so, um, yeah, this is a bag I travel with. So, um, but if there is crampons or ice axe in it, I can't check it in. Uh, I have to check it in. I can't bring it with me in the cabin. Um, they wouldn't allow an ice axe or uh, I think even crampons on the flight. Um, that's actually a good question for the folks doing Shasta from Seattle because I just drove. Um, I don't know if you guys are taking a flight from here for Shasta. Um, crampons might be a better idea to then rent over there. And the uh, ice axe is a part of the package anyway. So that's what I would say. Yeah, hope that helps. Thank you. Sure. Expert bag has zippers at each side for easy access. 45 liter, which is good for smaller trips like Helen's. Yeah, should be great. I haven't tried it, um, Ina, um, and it's been a while. I'd done a lot of research when I was climbing and acquiring all, all the gear four years ago, but yeah, the side zippers also help to access uh, stuff. Um, were there any questions that I missed? Feel free to uh, just jump in and ask the questions, but if not, because we're like 15, 17 minutes over, I've... Uh, all right, it looks like no more questions. We've got through all the, que all the questions. So unless anyone shouts that they still have a question, we're gonna end it um, over here. I hope everybody found it um, useful and I hope everyone has a successful um, climbing season. So don't be hung up on the summit. It's still gonna be a great learning experience. It will be a big accomplishment. You've all trained for it if you're all climbing this season. So yeah, I wish you all the very best. And um, something that you would have already heard of is, um, you know, uh, Summiting is optional, coming back is not. So don't get something called as a summit fever. It's important to get the experience, come back down safely. If you get the summit, that's fantastic. Otherwise, it's about the journey. Enjoy the journey, enjoy the climb. You've learned so much, you've trained and, and you've gotten better than you know where you started. So, so that's all matters and, and all the best to everyone. Thank all right. So Thank you. Yeah. Very informative. This was of course. so informative. Thank you so much. Of course, of Thank course. You. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye.